Well, this morning we're going to um, return to uh, John chapter 16, and we're actually working our way through these uh, five chapters a bit more quickly than I expected at the beginning, uh, because there aren't a large number of themes in, in this uh, section, but uh, it, Jesus keeps returning to them and, and kind of interspersing them and kind of weaving them together. Uh, so as I find, you know, new topics, new reasons to find that comfort that Jesus is seeking to give to His disciples, I want to center on that. Now, this morning, we're going to be looking at, um, actually this morning and this evening, <clears throat> Uh, the, the remainder of, of John chapter 16. So uh, verses 16 through 33, and what I'd like to do is read that to begin with. We're going to look at one of the themes that's in here, which has to do with the fact that the disciples were going to experience grief because Jesus was going to leave them for a little while, but then they were going to experience joy because they would see Him again. And of course, um, there are in here also reasons for us to be joyful, but Jesus is also going to tell them that because He's going away, and, and this is for this evening really, their relationship with Him and with the Father is going to change, and that's going to change then how they would ask for certain things and how the Lord would um, respond to them. Uh, and I think that that's really quite encouraging. Uh, some of these things are a little bit difficult to, um, to see the distinctions of, between, you know, the Old Testament and the New Testament when they're with Jesus, what He wants them to do, and then when Jesus goes away and how things change. And I think that that's one of the things we're going to be looking at, but I think you'll find it to be uh, very interesting. But this morning, let's begin by reading uh, verses 16 through 33. Jesus <clears throat> says to His disciples, a little while and you will no longer see Me. And again a little while, and you will see me. Some of his disciples then said to one another, What is this thing he is telling us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again a little while, and you will see me. And because I go to the Father. So they were saying, What is this that he says? A little while. We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wished to question him, and he said to them, are you deliberating together about this that I said, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. In that day, you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made full. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language. An hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but will tell you plainly of the Father. In that day... You will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will request the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. His disciples said, Lo, now you are speaking plainly and are not using a figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace in the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. Well, between this morning and this evening, we hope to see what it is that, that our Lord is actually telling us in this text. Now, first of all, uh, just by way of review, in our passage, 
We see Jesus again preparing for his departure to go back to his Father in heaven by way of the cross. Now, we see that he's preparing, but it's not that Jesus really needed to do anything to get ready because Jesus essentially was ready at all times. He was ready at all times to do the Father's will because that is what he was doing all the time, ready to make any sacrifice that he might require. Now, when obedience is the only direction of your life, you don't find that you, you know, find yourself having to shift gears between, you know, one and the other, between living for yourself and living for God. You're always going to be ready to serve Him because that's what you're always doing. You know, one of the, I think one of the most difficult things that we have to do in, in just breaking through the barrier, I think it's been called the, uh, the pain barrier at one point uh, by one of the former speakers we heard, is getting out of the clutches of our flesh, you know, trying to break away from our desires to do other things. If we're doing the Lord's will all the time and we're intent on doing that and that is what we're aiming at, it's not going to be so difficult when it comes time to serve Him because that's what we're always doing. But you see, that's exactly the kind of life that Jesus lived. So He was ready to go to the cross. He was ready to do the Father's will. It was the disciples who weren't really ready for Jesus to leave. And so Jesus is preparing them. They needed comfort. They needed to be reassured that once Jesus was gone, that they would be able to do what they needed to do. They would be able to face the world, a world that Jesus just told them is going to hate them because they, the world hated Him. And so He's been preparing them by telling them what it is that they could expect. Now, thankfully, in the Lord's mercy and in His grace, the things that He's telling them are the things that He has also provided for us, all of which I've been telling you throughout the service are meant to give us joy. So what did He tell him? Well, again, quickly by way of review of the things we've been seeing in what, again, this is called the upper room discourse, those last words of Jesus to His disciples before He goes to the cross. He told them, stop worrying, first of all, that He was leaving, and yet, but He was leaving to prepare a place for them in His Father's house, which was in heaven, and that when He left, He would return again to bring them home. Now, this is the the ultimate promise of assurance. I mean, this is something I think that Christians want more than anything else is to know that they really do belong to God and they really are going to make it safely to heaven. Well, Jesus is saying here that if you're trusting Him, that is what He will do for you. You will see heaven. And of course, what could bring a greater joy than to know that ultimately you're going to make it? Now, He was going to go to heaven and obviously they were going to be Uh, at least in in their understanding, left to themselves. But Jesus says He wasn't going to leave them as orphans. He was going to send another helper who would be a father to them, even as Jesus had been. When you look at how Jesus treated His disciples, how He loved them, how He cared for them, how He directed them, everything He did for them, He is the perfect example of a father. That is what He was to them, using His authority, using uh, basically his gifts, everything, to minister to them, to help them, to train them. Well, Jesus was leaving. Who was going to do this for them now? Well, he says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to send my spirit. And his spirit is still present today in the hearts of his people by faith, bearing witness to our hearts if we're trusting in Jesus that we are the children of God. He is the one who is our source of comfort. He is the one who is our source of direction and teaching. He is the one who trains us as a father would his children. And again, that is another source of joy. Now, he knew they didn't have the ability to do what he had called them to do. Apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. But he says, the Spirit of God would give you power, power to bear good fruit, power to do what he had commanded, well, what he's commanded us to do, and to do it from the heart out of a desire to give glory to God. And Jesus, when He said this, that that in doing this, He assured them that they would find joy. Jesus said, I love my Father and I kept His commandments and I abide in His love. And if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love and this will bring you joy. 
So by giving us the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to do what the Lord has called us to do, and we surrender ourselves to Him to serve Him, we experience the same kind of joy that Jesus experienced when He surrendered Himself to the Father's will, which He did willingly and He did joyfully because He loves His Father. And yes, the world would hate them because their lives and the message they were going to be preached or they were preaching would be full of light, full of the light of God's truth, and the world would hate them for it, but the Spirit would restrain the world through His convicting power and would even bring His people to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ through their message, even as He promises that He will do through us. He'll restrain the world through, through conviction to protect us, and He will also convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, bringing some to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And really, what, what uh, I mean, among all the things, all the sources of joy that the Lord has given to us, seeing people come to Christ has to be one of the greatest. Being just a part of that process by which the Lord actually brings people out of darkness into light can bring a great deal of joy. Now, in our passage, Jesus points out two more things that would increase their joy. Now, first of all, they were going to have to go through a time of suffering or a time of grief. They were going to be grieved by the fact that Jesus was going to leave, and it seems to be somewhat veiled to their understanding that what He was saying is that He was going to die, but their grief would turn into joy and rejoicing when they would see Him again at His resurrection. It would fill them with a joy that no one would ever be able to take away. And then secondly, through His death and through His glorification and through the coming of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of adoption, they would have a joy of direct access to the Father in prayer in the name of Jesus, which apparently is different than what they had prior to this. And we'll look at those differences this evening. So what we want to do is this morning consider the first thing here, that they were going to go through this this time of grieving, but their grieving would turn into joy, and this evening we'll look at the second. So first of all, Jesus tells them that there was a great grief that was ahead of them, but there was also great joy. He says in a short time He would be gone, and then in a short time He would return. We read in verse 16, a little while and you will no longer see me, and again a little while and you will see me. Now, I don't think they understood what he was talking about. I think it's clear from what we read that what follows. But we know he was talking about his crucifixion and his resurrection. Now, this was their last evening together. This is the Passover meal. This is Thursday evening. In a very little while, they were going to go to Gethsemane to pray. Jesus was going to be arrested. Jesus was going to be put on trial very Late at night, very early in the morning by the Jews, he was going to be condemned. In the morning, he was going to be handed over to the Romans for execution. So in a very short time, he would be gone. In a, very, in a little while, you will no longer see me. But it would also be a short time before they would see him again. As I mentioned, it's Thursday evening. Jesus was going to die and be buried on Friday. And then he would rise again on Sunday. Now, they didn't understand what he was talking about. A little while you, you won't see me, and a little while again you will see me. We read in verses 17 through 18, some of his disciples then said to one another, what is this thing he is telling us? A little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me. And because I go to the Father. So they were saying, what is this that he says? A little while. We do not know what he is talking about. I think this is interesting because Jesus had already told them on numerous occasions about His death that He was going to be betrayed, that He was going to be killed, that He was going to His Father, that He was leaving to prepare a place for them. And I think they had some understanding of what that meant. But they still didn't seem to understand. They still just couldn't seem to get past the idea that, that was common among all the Jews that Jesus didn't come to die and to go to heaven and to bring in a kingdom that was spiritual, but rather he came to bring an earthly kingdom, one that was going to overthrow the Romans. They were still looking forward to that, and that meant that Jesus could not die. 
I mean, earlier in chapter 12, which is taking place just before this upper room discourse, we read in John chapter 12, verses 31 through 34, Jesus speaking to his disciples, but mainly to the Jewish crowd, we see them reflecting this idea of the Messiah and what the Messiah should do. Jesus says this, now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. The crowd then answered him, We have heard out of the law that the Christ, the Messiah, is to remain forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Well, what the Jews were expressing there is the same thing that the disciples still seem to be holding on to. How can, how can Christ die? How can he go away? He's supposed to be here forever. And even after Jesus rose again from the dead, spent another 40 days with his disciples, teaching them about the kingdom of God, giving them more information, even after they saw him die and rise again from the dead, just before he ascended, they asked him exactly the same question. In Acts 1, verse 6, this is just before his ascension. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Are you now going to overthrow the Romans? Are you now going to grant Israel her freedom? Are you going to redeem Israel? Well, you know, Jesus didn't answer that question directly because they still didn't understand they still weren't ready to hear what it is he had planned. They were still growing in their understanding. They did not understand that Jesus didn't come to bring that kind of a kingdom. As a matter of fact, what he did come to bring was a spiritual kingdom that would incorporate not just Jews, not just for national Israel, but also Gentiles, all the nations of the earth. He would bring them into that kingdom, into one body and into one church. He didn't tell them that. But what he did tell them was what they needed to know at that particular point to do what it is they needed to do in order to bring that about. He says in verses 7 and 8, this was his response. It is not for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of of the earth. Jesus doesn't always tell us what we want to know, but he will tell us what we need to know always so that we will need that we'll have what we need to do or need to know to do as well. Now again, Jesus knew what they were thinking, and so he explained himself a bit further in verses 19 and 20. Jesus knew that they wished to question him and he said to them, are you deliberating together about this that I said, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Now again, we're, we're looking at them and we're thinking, what's your problem? What don't you understand? But we need to understand that we are on this side of the cross and we have the rest of the story in our hands. Uh, they didn't have that advantage. What Jesus was telling them, of course, was just in a few hours they would grieve because Jesus, the one whom they loved, the one they hoped would redeem Israel, which is what the two on the road to Emmaus said to Jesus when they didn't recognize him and they're, they're mourning and they're grieving. And Jesus said, what are you guys so, what you're so sad about? And he said, are you a stranger here? Don't you know what's been taking place? They just crucified Jesus. We were hoping he was the one that would redeem Israel. Well, Jesus just had redeemed Israel. They just didn't understand it. But they had this expectation, and that was going to be taken away because Jesus was going to be put to death. They would also grieve because when the time came for Jesus to be arrested, that they would fail to stand with him. They would all abandon him, leaving him to face these things on his own, and yet Jesus said he would not be alone. And here's, here's where we jump forward to verse 32. He says, Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, 
because the Father is with me. Now, <laughs> here's two things to be grieved about. Jesus, the one you had pinned your hopes on, was going to be taken away. Uh, the one you love is gone, but when the time came, you didn't stand with him. You, you, didn't, you, you thought you had the strength. You thought you would fight with him. You thought you would go to the death with him, but instead you ran for your life. That's another reason uh, to be grieved, and that was going to come upon them as well. So Jesus says, you're going to lament, you're going to weep. But the world, on the other hand, they're going to rejoice. Jesus told us last week not to be surprised if the world hates us because it hated him first. The world wanted to kill him because through the light he was shining, he exposed the evil that was in their hearts. And when they thought they succeeded by putting him to death, they would begin to celebrate. You're going to grieve, but the world is going to rejoice. But thankfully, in just a very short time, these things would be reversed. Their celebration would come to an end, and so would the disciples' grief. Jesus would rise, and the disciples would see him again. And even though they would be ashamed of how they had behaved when it came down to standing with him, the assurance that he gave them of his love and his pardon would banish all their sorrow and give them great joy. Now, Jesus tells us in verses 21 and 23 that their experience would be very similar to that of a woman giving birth, which only women can understand, but men know something of it, but obviously women who have done this, have gone through it, understand it better. This is what he says, whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to a child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. In that day, you will not question me about anything. Now, you know, it seems clear enough, but it still wasn't. So seeing that they were just a bit confused, Jesus finally lifts the veil and speaks more directly to them. In verse 25 and verses 28 through 31. First, first verse 25. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language. An hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but will tell you plainly of the Father. Why were they confused? Why didn't they understand? Well, because up to this point, Jesus has not been speaking as directly as he could. I think you've, you've noticed that. When the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw the world. I mean, that makes some sense. But the Jews are saying, well, who's the Son of Man? Because Jesus is not speaking directly. When I'm lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. So now he removes this veil, this partial veil, and begins to speak more directly. So he says in verses 28 through 31, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. His disciples said, Lo, now you are speaking plainly and are not using a figure of speech. Now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you have come from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? So Jesus here is, again, telling them a little bit more plainly what it is that's going to happen. He had come from the Father into the world in order to save them. Now he was going to complete this work by laying down his life and then he was going to return to the Father, and when he, we got there, he would pour out the blessings that he had been telling them, the ones he had been promising them. But again, now, what is the point behind all of this? Why was Jesus telling them all of these things? Well, so that they would be ready, of course, on the one hand, but also to prepare them for something. Look at verse 33. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. You see, the, the table reminds us Jesus was put to death by the world, but he didn't stay dead. He rose again from the dead. He has overcome the world. Now, the disciples were moving into a very gloomy time. Jesus was about to be betrayed. He was about to be killed. It looked like their hopes were going to be permanently dashed to pieces. 
But that was not going to be the case. They would grieve, but their grief would be turned into joy. They would be tempted to think that everything that they had done on these three and a half years they had spent with Jesus, everything that He had promised and said was going to amount to nothing. It had all been for nothing. But He would give them, in just a little time, the settled peace that all of it was true. They are forgiven. They are redeemed. There is a kingdom. It is eternal, and they will be with Jesus. And the world would threaten them. But in spite of their hatred and threats, they could have courage because Jesus has overcome the world and He would continue to stand by them even as He said that He would. Now, let's, let's spend just a couple of moments applying this to our own situation. Uh, we obviously are not on this side of the crucifixion of Christ, so we're not faced with exactly the same trial that the disciples were faced with. Jesus has already been to the cross. Jesus has already been raised from the dead. He's already ascended into heaven. We have the rest of the New Testament. We know the rest of the story. We can have the joy that He was promising them of knowing that He isn't dead, but He is alive, and that everything He said was true. We have been saved from our sins. If we have put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're safe. And we can have all these things that, that He promised to them. And like I said, that's true if we have trusted Jesus. If you haven't trusted Jesus, then put your trust in Him. He's the only one who can give you these things. He's the only one who's overcome sin, hell, death, the world. He's the only one who can give you victory over these things. But even though we don't have to face the particular trial they did prior to His crucifixion, we do have to face the same thing they faced after His resurrection and after His ascension into heaven because we're still in that same situation today. The same one they had to face with, the one that, uh, well, Jesus was warning them about. The world hates you. You're, you're bound to meet with it while you're in this world. So we're not in heaven yet, obviously. We still have work to do that our Lord has given us to do. We are to shine His lights. We are to shine His lights. We are to shine the gospel. We are to tell it to other people. And we are to do it in a world that is hostile toward Jesus and is hostile toward us. I hope we all understand. We, we looked at that earlier. But Jesus said, don't be surprised if the world hates you. You know that it hated me first. So... If, it, if they hate the master, they're going to hate the members of his household. They're going to hate the servants as well. They're going to treat us the same way they treated Jesus. The world is going to be hostile to us. The work then is going to be difficult. It's going to be hard, which means that in, at least at some times, there are going to be times of grief. I think grief over our failures, grief over our sins that we have to deal with because we are going to fall into temptation. We are going to get off the track from time to time. Grief over our apparent lack of success where we are you know, sowing seed. We're seeking to do what the Lord calls us to do. We're praying and yet we don't really see the fruit of that. Grief over the declining condition of the world. I mean, it, remember how Lot was troubled by the wickedness of Sodom when he lived in Sodom? Do you know something of what Lot experienced by the world in which we're living? Things are continuing to run down, and that can bring grief. Grief from the times when our faith weakens, perhaps because of all these things. And we, we see our own faults, and we see our lack of success, and we see that the world doesn't seem to be changing as we continue to pray that God might change things. And we know in the past He has, in very powerful ways, changed society almost overnight. Well, there are things that can bring us grief, but let's not forget that Jesus has provided through His work positive things, good things, joy, peace, and the fact that we can have courage in the face of the world. We can have the same kind of joy the disciples had, knowing that Jesus is real, knowing that He is alive and He is well in heaven, knowing that one day He's going to return and bring us to heaven. We can know that if we're trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. We can have joy knowing that we are connected to Him, that He has given us His Spirit, that He has given us power 
power to do what He has called us to do, power to do things we could not do on our own, power to bear good fruit, power to glorify the Father, to serve Him, to submit to Him, to submit to Christ, and experience, of course, that same joy of basking in the revelation of His love when we stand in that right place with Him, in the place of obedience. We can have joy in the expectation that as we give ourselves more and more to Him, that we can experience more and more of these blessings and store up treasures in heaven. We can have the blessing of, of not being afraid, not being anxious that all these things are really just some kind of fairy tale and they're not true. We can have the settled peace of knowing that these things are real. We can know that because Jesus is alive and that He rules and reigns from heaven, that He will take care of us. He will, as we read in Romans chapter 8, work all things together for our good. And that He will bring us to the place that He has prepared for us. We can know it's all true. We can have a settled peace of knowing that it is true by His Holy Spirit. How do you know the Bible's true? How do you know that everything it says is true? How do you know that these invisible things the Bible tells us about really exist? Is it because somebody convinced you from, you know, reasonable arguments? Ultimately, it comes from the Spirit of God whom Jesus sent into the world to dwell in our hearts. He is the one who convinces us that these things are true. He's the one who shows us that the evidence really does prove the point that these things are real. And we can have courage knowing that Jesus has overcome the world. The world hated Him and put Him to death, as we know. But they were only doing what the Father had originally planned. You know it was His plan that His Son would go to the cross. It was something He did willingly. And Jesus went to the cross so that He might overcome all of His enemies, which are our enemies, so that He might overcome the enemy of our souls, the devil, that He might crush the devil as the Lord had promised to Adam and Eve in the garden, remember? Uh, he has crushed Satan. Uh, he has overcome the world that hates us. He has overcome our sins, the guilt of our sins that would have condemned us. And He has overcome our flesh so that we're no longer slaves to sin. But now we are free. Now, Jesus has given us through these things, through His work, everything that we need to do what He has called us to do. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. I've already told you that in the world we're going to meet with disappointment. There's going to be things that we do that are going to grieve us, things the world do that are going to grieve us, and so forth. But what Jesus has done means that we can have joy in the midst of that difficulty. We can have peace, and we can know that even though the work is difficult, it's still going to move forward. It's not impossible. It is possible. The kingdom of heaven will advance as we are faithful to do what the Lord has called us to do. We simply need to trust Him and to move forward, knowing that by His grace, we can do this. And of course, that too should give us joy, that we can really be free from the things that keep us from doing what it is we would like to do more than anything else, and that is give ourselves to the Lord. Now again, that is what the table reminds us of this morning, that Jesus has overcome the world. He overcame the world through His cross. Uh, yes, the world thought that they had overcome Him, but when He rose from the dead, He clearly, it was His vindication from the Father that He is the Messiah, He is the Savior, he is the one who said He was. He has given what He said He would, has, has given. He will do what He said He would do. He is the one who has done all that is necessary for us to do what we need to do. And so let's begin to think now about the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, how on the cross He vanquished our enemies, how on the cross He did defeat the world, how on the cross He redeemed all of His people, how there is power now in the gospel because of the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will gather together His people into one. Nothing can stop Him from doing that. Nothing that hell can mount as a resistance. Nothing that the devil might inspire in the world can stop it. And there's also nothing the devil can do to us any longer because we've been set free 
set free from His power. He no longer has power to command us because Jesus has put His Spirit in our hearts and given us love uh, for Him. Now, as we prepare to come to the table, I, I do want simply to remind us that the table of the Lord is Jesus gave this to His disciples as He ministered it to them. It was meant for His church. It was meant for those that were trusting in Him. Yes, Judas was present. Uh, we know that Jesus, you know, He was there at the table. At least that's the way it appears. And Jesus, you know, there was an unbeliever present, but yet He was still counted among the disciples and among the Lord's people. Jesus didn't give it to the world. He didn't open it up to the Jews and say, let's just have a national feast day in Israel and everybody who wants to come will come. But it was one that was for His disciples. This is for those who are trusting the Lord, those who are visible saints, those who confess the Lord Jesus Christ, those who are following the Lord Jesus Christ. We do have a warning in Scripture that before we come to the table that we should be careful, that we examine ourselves, make sure that we're repenting of all of our sins. Uh, again, remembering what sin is. Sin is hatred toward God. Sin is hatred toward our neighbors. Sin is harmful. We need to repent of all of that and desire to put on love, the same kind of love with which Jesus loved us. So we need to have that heart. We need to have that faith in Christ. We need to have that repentance. That's what repentance is, is putting away the hatred and putting on love as we come to the table. Otherwise, uh, the Lord, well, He'll, He'll discipline us if we know Him. If we don't know Him, then we're sinning against Him by coming to the table and if we don't repent in the future, that will be even make it worse for us on the day of judgment. So we need to believe and we need to repent. So let's spend just a few moments in silent prayer and let's prepare to come to the table.